Chapter 21 Rupert Venables continued. Zinka and I stopped and looked at one another. Someone's done a working out here, she said. I can feel it. So could I feel it now. It was what White had been doing after he shouted outside my door. I knew I should have felt it when I left, but I had been in too much of a hurry. I had slipped up again. I cursed. The working had been designed to fetch Nick out of my room the next time the door opened. Will told us the way of it when we walked slowly up to him and he stood up, red and exasperated, after shooing the quack chick back inside. I thought the damn door was shut, he said, but you must have left it open a crack. No, I didn't, I said. Graham White left a working on it. Oh, I see, Will said, and ran his hands through his woolly hair in the manner of Dak Ross. I couldn't understand it. Both bloody chicks got out. Nick and I were out here rounding them up when those two came marching up. And she said, Come along, Nick, I need you. And he obviously couldn't think of a reason not to go with them. Didn't even argue, just went. We watched Graham, Nick and Janine turn the corner out of sight. Not much to be done, Zinka said. She is his mother. That's the problem. So what do we do now? You've got a major working half finished in there. You can't just leave it. I'll go, I said, if you can keep the road open. It was what I'd been aching to do anyway. I could barely credit it when Will and Zinka both sternly shook their heads. It was your working, Rupert, Zinka said, and Will added, You can't start a working on the outside and then go inside, Rupe. You must remember Stan telling you that. It's basic. Magids have been lost that way, Zinka said. Will said, But Rob says he'll go. He was wanting to go back with Nick anyway. I was trying to tell him how dangerous it is to alter a working halfway through when those damn chicks got out. It's altered anyway, I snapped and flung inside the room. And here was further trouble. In the odd-shaped space left between the roadway of candles and my bed, Rob was half on his feet, supporting himself painfully on the bedside table with one hand. His other hand was pointing to the road itself. I couldn't stop them. I was too slow, he said. I followed his pointing finger, and I saw the two quack chicks scurrying between the only two lighted candles, off the carpet, and onto the hillside beyond. I confess, my first thought was, good riddance. My second was to wonder anxiously what damage this would do to the working. Will and Zinka crowded into the room behind me, just in time to see the chicks scuttle down over the shadowy brow of the hill and disappear. Oh no, said Will. Zinka's eyes scanned the dark landscape lying at such a queer angle to the rest of my room. I could see she was awed. But she said dryly, Ah, oh, Mr White has done even better than he expected, hasn't he? I don't think you should fetch them back now. What do you want to do, Rupert? We carry on regardless, I said. Marie's out there waiting. In that case, Rob said, I have to go, don't I? Will and Zinka edged down beside the frilly chair by the bathroom. I shut the door of my room and we all looked at Rob. Zinka looked at him with frank, lascivious admiration. You could see why. Even ill and pale, with his horse coat dull and staring, Rob was a magnificent sight. He stood himself cautiously on all four hooves. I do owe Marie, he said. She can't manage alone. And you made me see. I see I've done a lot of damage and I ought to try to put it right. He is mage trained, Will said. But you're ill, I objected. Besides, I still wanted to go myself. I can manage, Rob said. His beautiful features twisted a little. If it hurts, it probably serves me right, doesn't it? I think you'll have to send him, Zinka said decisively. It fits. After that, I couldn't argue any more. The two candles burning on the edge of the dark landscape reached nearly a third gone. We had wasted enough time. What does he need to take? I asked Zinka. Water's easy, she said. I see you've got four little empty bottles. Now, for wool, I've got a cashmere sweater, I offered. Then you'd better get it unravelled, Zinka said. What? I said. The feel of the verse is for war wool, she explained. In a hank, you know. Will stood in the bathroom door with a fistful of little bottles, laughing at the look on my face. Not to worry, he said. 
He fished in the pocket of his coat and came up with a big handful of fluffy white goat's hair. This do? he asked Zinka. Perfect, she said. The last of our hasty preparations had to be done with the door of my room open, mostly in the passage outside. Rob, being so much longer than a human, could not fit into the space in front of the road when the door was closed. He was forced to hop, wincing at the jolt, across the first pair of candles, then out through the doorway and on into the corridor, where he turned himself to face into my room. There Zinka handed him a candle and Will's belt pouch, with the four little bottles of water clinking in it despite being packed round with a goat's wool. There you go, she said, lovingly fastening the belt around Rob's muscular waist parts, while I stood waiting impatiently with my lighter and the plastic bags of grain and salt. There. Do try to come back, Rob. You're too stunning to lose. Rob had been looking ahead, very tense and determined, but at this he flung back his sheet of black hair and turned his face down to Zinka's. You think so? he said. His whole pose turned amorous. So did Zinka's. I more or less ground my teeth, but before I could say anything, I heard the thud of sprinting feet on the carpet. I whirled round. Nick came flying up to us and caught hold of me to stop himself. Oh, good, he said. Rob's going too. We stared at him. I thought your mother, Zinka said. I told her I was going to bed, Nick said. That's all she wanted me for anyway. OK, Rob, let's get going, shall we? Will and I looked at one another and grinned remembering how deftly Nick had avoided Janine before. Hold out your hand, I said, advancing on Nick with my grain and salt. Both hands, Zinka corrected me, and thrust a candle into Nick's other hand. I had filled Nick's hand with mingled salt and grain, and was just about to tip grain into Rob's outstretched hand, when I thought I heard footsteps again. Again I whirled round. Graham White was coming round the corner from the same direction as Nick. Almost certainly he had been following Nick. I saw him in the mirrors first, reaching into his armpit under his robe in a way that could only mean he was fetching out a gun. Things seemed to go into slow motion. I had time to realise that, if I could see him, then Graham White would have a distant view of us too, including Rob, and that Rob would be the one he shot first. I had plenty of time to plant the plastic bags on the floor. I had what felt like half an hour's leisure to build a thick shield across the corridor and then to check the other way, in case Janine was coming from the other end. But White was on his own. He came round the corner and fired. He aimed, I think, at Rob's head. The boom and the crack of the rebound shook floor, walls, air, everything. At least I got something right, I thought. I watched a rather large slice of the ceiling slowly unhitch and crash down on the carpet. Quick work! Will said shakily. Before White could fire again, Zinka trod the fallen plaster to flakes as she marched down the passage. Graham White, she said. Her voice rang as loudly as the shot. Instead of getting smaller as she marched away from us, her rosy figure actually seemed to grow bigger. White backed away as she advanced on him. Graham White, she said. You do anything like that again, and I'll make you sorry you were ever born. She was magnificent. But we didn't, even Rob, dare wait and watch. I hurriedly filled Rob's hand with grain and salt and stowed the remainder in the belt bag, along with a candle for Marie and my spare lighter. Will, meanwhile, lit Nick's candle and then Rob's. Then we both bolted into my room to the far end and began relighting the double row of candles and saying the rhyme. Since Nick and Rob could see the road, they started forward at once. I remember looking up between the third and fourth pair of candles and seeing them go past, both in profile and surprisingly alike, not only in the actual classic shape of their faces, but also in their expressions. Both looked thoroughly determined, and with both, you wondered how long that would last. Rob's resolution might survive pain, but not if something offered him an easy way out. Nick would probably scorn an easy way out, but I knew I would not trust him if he were asked to sacrifice something he wanted. And I had a strong feeling that both the easy way and the sacrifice were waiting out there on that hard-to-see grey road. We had reached the end of Will's first when, to my relief, Zinka came back, expressively dusting her hands in time to say her own verse. She shut the door and leant against it while we all recited the last one. By that time, Nick and Rob were visible down below as two dark shapes and two pricks of light crossing the level towards the next hill, making good time. 
We watched them wind up that hill, and went on watching until it was clear that the pinpricks of light did not carry far enough for us to see them on the next rise. It was all dark out there. Right, said Zinka. I got rid of White for the moment, but I'll tell you what I'll do. There's a party somewhere on this floor. I wasn't going to go, because Thurlis invited me there, but I think I will go now. I'll make sure to be there at least until dawn, and I'll be listening. If White comes back or anything else happens, one of you two just call me or phone room 509. OK? Before you do, I said, would you mind terribly checking Nick's room for us? It worries me that his mother wanted him there. Good thought, said Zinka. She went off to do that. I said to Will, I'm going to risk putting out all the candles but the last two again, and then relighting the next pair as soon as the end pair begin to gutter. That way, they'll last nine times as long. Will rubbed his face, thinking about it. The only trouble with that, now we know the road stays there as long as there are two candles burning, the trouble is that someone's going to have to sit and watch them and relight the next lot. I was going to sit and watch anyway, I said. In that case, said Will, would you mind if I got some sleep? I was up near dawn milking the goats. Go ahead, I said. So, Will climbed under my slightly blood-stained duvet, uttering a great weary yawn. He was asleep almost at once. He never even stirred when Zinka came back. You were right, she told me. And here was I, thinking you were being paranoid. I take it back. There was a really strong slave spell in there. I mean strong. About ten times the strength of whatever you did to that lift. Even a selfish kid like that Nick would find himself doing anything they wanted after five minutes in there with that thing. I scotched it, but I made it look as if it was still there. Is that what you wanted? Yes, I said. Thanks, Zinka. Unless... Has he got a computer? Nice little laptop, she said. But I don't know about computers. I'll take a look at it tomorrow, I said wearily. After what had been done to Marie's computer, there was almost certainly something wrong with Nick's too. The list of things I had to do tomorrow seemed to stretch out like a supermarket bill. After Zinka had gone, I moved the frilly chair around with its back to the door and folded the wheelchair up. It occurred to me that the wheelchair, though more comfortable, could get shunted forward between the lines of candles if someone like Zinka, to whom locks mean nothing, came in suddenly behind me. I could then be willy-nilly in the midst of a working I should be outside of. Will and Zinka had been right about the dangers of that. If it hadn't been Marie out there, I would never have dreamt of suggesting it. I turned out the lights and sat in the frilly chair. With only the two candles alight, down to a small, small glimmer, the landscape out there was slightly easier to see. It was as if someone had drawn on black paper with the faintest of faint grey luminous air spray, a rolling moor-like distance and a faint road looping across it. Far, far off, there may have been the loom of something else beyond the horizon, but I couldn't see it. I couldn't go there. There was no point trying to speculate on what was happening to the three people journeying out there. All I could do was hold the road and watch the candles. After a while, the party made itself heard from down the passage outside, muffled by the wards round my room. I was glad of it. I was, by that time, thoroughly enmeshed in the kind of thoughts I'd been warning myself not to think, and it helped to have the noise. It reminded me there was life beyond my room. I thought of Rob, buoyant, flashy, flimsy young centaur, with that sort of slave-child mentality that whines when things go wrong. It's not my fault. I didn't mean to. Rob expected adults to scold him. He preferred that, I suspected, to accepting a fault and blaming himself. But he would duck out of both if he could, smiling limpidly the while, of course. It was probably the result of being brought up by that kingly granite statue, Naros. Will had shamed Rob into better behaviour, but Will had only been at work on Rob for an hour or so, and Rob had had Naros all his life. If the journey proved as hard as the rhyme suggested, I knew Rob would be the first to crack. Then I thought of Nick. Nick's personality seemed to me to run deeper, stronger and more complex than Rob's. When Nick ducked out of things, he didn't signal it in advance like Rob did. He just vanished. He was, I suspected, quite ruthless about it, and about what he himself wanted. I had no idea what Nick did want, really. Except I was sure it was not to rule an empire. 
because Nick had a dark private core. Possibly he didn't know what was in there himself yet, but he knew enough to duck out if that core was threatened, and he would. I knew that. Rob and Nick shared, deep in their genes, a very strong selfishness. It was the same selfishness that had made their common father set up the whole mad mess in the first place. Marie seemed to me to have escaped that selfishness. It was one of the things I'd come to like about her. One of the many things. I wished I dared hope there were things she had come to like about me, but I couldn't think of any. I thought of Marie instead, fierce, droll, unhappy little fighter as she was. She saw deep into things. I wondered, though, if she saw deep enough into herself. It could be that, in that way, she was not selfish enough. People who regard themselves as sacred, like Nick and his father, the Emperor, know when fighting is worth it and when it is not. I doubted that Marie did know. She could well hurl herself uselessly into something out there and lose. She could equally well lose by not defending herself when she should do. And with only half of herself present, the loss could be fatal. As I said, I was glad that the gruff roar and distant music of the party kept forcing itself on my attention. I made a strong effort to think of something else. I thought of Janine and her brother Graham White and their intentions. Long ago, Janine must somehow have persuaded Timos the Ninth to let her go into exile in a strange world as guardian of her own son and of Marie, where Janine must rapidly have married Ted Mallory and equally rapidly got Marie adopted by Ted's brother Derek. The Emperor let her go. She was only a lesser consort, and someone as paranoid as Timos must certainly have known she had ambitions. Furthermore, Janine's son and Marie, whose mother must also have been a lesser consort, I imagine, were both embarrassingly older than the children of true wives. The Emperor must have sent them off Naywood out of trouble with relief. He could not have realised, when he took care to become the brother-in-law of Naros, and so ensure the centaur's loyalty, that Graham White had then done the same three years later. The birth of the centaur Chris involved Naros in a little dynasty and a further loyalty to Janine this time. No, obviously the Emperor had not known or he would never have put Naros in charge of the other children. So what happened then? Janine seemed to have waited until Nick was old enough to make a credible emperor, though not old enough to defy her, one supposes, while White learnt to make and use projectile weapons. Before that, he must have been trained as a mage. They must have both been in constant touch with other people on Korophos, and bided their time until they could organise that explosion in the palace. When the time came... At this point I said, Oh God! out loud. I had caused the timing of it. I had brought it to a head. I had started looking for Marie. I had told Janine's two sisters-in-law that I was looking for Marie in order to give her a legacy. The one with all the children had actually phoned Janine and told her in front of me. On top of that, I had written to Marie and told Janine herself. She must have known me for a magid at once. People from Iwoods can always tell. I could imagine how that had struck Janine. For legacy, read birthright. A magid looking for Marie because Marie was now the Emperor's eldest child. I had precipitated the explosion and caused the deaths of those three children, not to speak of countless others all over the Empire. I groaned, howled more like, with such force that Will rolled about grunting in his sleep. I was about to make more noises when I fortunately remembered that there had, all along, been a strong smell of these things being intended. In other words, I thought bitterly, those ruthless bastards in the upper room wanted certain things to happen in the Corophonic Empire. So they set two connecting chains of action going and made sure the magic in charge of both is a self-confident little bungler. Me. Ah, oh, Venables. Led by the nose by everyone. Mistakes guaranteed to order. Gah. The question was, what was the upper room intending precisely? Did they really, truly want Graham White for the next Corophonic Emperor? Because that was what they were going to get. Janine would reign as Empress Regent for a short while. White would establish himself as her indispensable sidekick until he was accepted as a fixture. Then it did not need Janine even to have an accident. It just took Nick to have one. Bingo. Gramos the first. 
But was I supposed to prevent this? For the first time, I stopped feeling uneasy that I had so blithely, with the help of two living majids and one disembodied, no less, sent all three remaining heirs to Babylon. I had no doubt that they were the only three living. White would never have left those two older girls alive if they had been a threat. He knew what he was doing, did White. After he had stripped Marie, he went after Rob. He had coaxed Nick out of my room in order to get Rob out too and get a shot at him. Janine would have told him Rob was in here. Ted Mallory told her. Probably half the convention told her. Smart operator, White. Doing better than our Venables here. Still, although it was an accident, I had sent Marie, Nick and Rob to the safest place there was. Except that they might not come back. With the working changed and disrupted halfway through, their chances of returning had halved. Heaven knows what mischief those two quack chicks had done. Even if all went well. Here I saw the two candles threatening to flicker out. I was only just in time to light the next two. Since there was no way I should tread in the road marked out by the candles, lighting them involved running frantically down outside it to light the first, then back up in the near dark to squeeze past the frilly chair and down the other side to light the other one. A little parable of my activities to date, I thought. It was a great relief to find the dark sketch of landscape was still in existence, even so. But now the two furthest candles were out, it was nearer. The stony path and the sharply shelving hill had advanced a couple of steps into the room. Hmm, I thought. I squeezed round to the kettle and made coffee more or less by touch. While the second pair of candles burned out, I thought mostly about what the hell I was going to tell Dacross when he came through on my car phone on Sunday morning. I seemed to specialise in letting Dacross down. I still hadn't thought what to say to him when I lit the third pair of candles and made more coffee. The party down the corridor took a new lease of life around the time I lit the fourth pair. I heard someone come out of another room and yell for quiet. <laughs> it made no difference. The stony path now stretched halfway across the room, night dark and slightly luminous, and I was glad of any interruption. I had been considering my faults. Not pleasant. I seemed to combine a degree of self-confidence and extreme pride in my abilities as a magid with a slightly pathetic tendency to rely on other people. Will and Stan, for a start. I couldn't decide whether my mistakes were worse when I took advice or when I went my own brash, confident way. Marie's ex-mother, Mrs. Nuttall, had probably got me summed up right, even if she had thought I was someone else. I wished I could relate to people more. But then I let them down. I hated that. I relit the fifth pair of candles with rather more time to spare. Thoughts like these make you want to rove about restlessly. The party had died to a mere mumble by then. I sat down again and found myself thinking wretchedly about those three murdered children. I could have prevented that. True, I had been distracted with magics to overcome and magics to perform, but I should not have been distracted. And if this was intended, I thought the worst of the upper room. I kept seeing the kids' clumsy sandals and their long, not-over-clean hair so severely in pigtails. I saw their tense, puzzled, ignorant faces. There were minds behind those faces that had never had a chance to work. You could see that their minds had been kept as chilly, comfortless and walled in as that courtyard where they were made to live. It was a double prison. They had, almost certainly, never been allowed even to imagine any bright, warm, extraordinary thing beyond the little penned-in world they knew. It was like Marie's Uncle Ted over his wobbly windows. Here I found myself smiling at Marie telling me of this angrily over the bookstalls. Except that these kids had not chosen to see only the distorted old glass. The glass was all they had been given. And, just when they might have had a chance to choose to look beyond... Their lives had been ended. For a short while there, I confess, I cried like Rob. Then I thought that Marie at least had had her chance to look beyond. I was glad of that. I took comfort from thinking of her and hoped she would forgive me for it. If she came back, if, if, 
if something would happen because Marie had looked beyond. She was that kind of person. She would thrust her way beyond with angry fingernails. She had been confined, too, by the same dreary bush goddess, but she had soldiered past. I hoped her life would be better now. I ached to let her have something better. I wanted her to come back more than I have ever wanted anything. Ever. But the hours passed. The fifth pair of candles guttered down, and nobody came back. I was definitely asleep in the frilly chair when I heard... Chapter 22. Rupert Venables continued. It was inside the room. I heard a pattering, a sharp clink, and the sound of a stone rolling. I jumped awake. The sixth pair of candles were well down, but not yet guttering. By their light I could clearly see the path stretching across the room, and then the brow of the hill, tantalisingly at the dark end between the burnt-out candles. I could still see into the dark stretch of landscape beyond. I stared avidly at the spot where the path tipped downhill, clutching the sides of my chair, my legs braced, ready to spring up. There was a bit more pattering, slow and sedate. Then, to my utter astonishment, two birds walked over the brow of the hill and paused to stare around with bright sapphire eyes. Seeing the room, they turned to one another in evident satisfaction. Each gently nibbled at the broad blue bill of the other. Then they turned again and solemnly advanced. They were as big as geese. I could see they had large webbed feet, so they were aquatic birds, but no kind that I knew. I simply did not understand what they were doing here, until they came within the full light of the candles. Then I could see the blue plumage, glossy and dark on the wings, and a shiny gentle azure on the breasts. They were thule quacks, outsized thule quacks. I had never seen quacks so large, or so healthy, or so obviously full of intelligence. They came right up to me, where each solemnly stropped a beak on my trouser leg in token of friendship, and then looked up at me with bright, distinctly humorous round eyes. How about this? they seemed to say. Good God! I more or less shouted. How about that? Will woke up at once. It was probably milking time by then, anyway. What? he said slurrily. Vendella been sick again? No, I said, laughing. The quack chicks are back. Take a look. Will surged up, looked, rubbed eyes, grated hands on bristly face, looked again. I don't believe it, he said. How did they get so big? He got up and came closer. The quacks turned to him and each dipped a head, almost as if they bowed. Aren't they glossy, Will said. What beauties! They look clever too. I think I shall have to make pets of these. I couldn't possibly sell them. No, I want them, I said. Can I, Will? Please? The return of the chicks and their metamorphosis struck me as the best of good omens. I wanted the quacks for that and for the fact that they had acknowledged me their friend. And if they were not an omen, well, I wanted them anyway. They were beautiful. Well, they're not an earth species, Will said dubiously. Still, you've got a breeding pair there, and they seem to like you. Why not? He looked out into the dark land. No sign of anything else out there? No, I said. He surveyed me and the remaining candles. Get some sleep, he said. You look whacked, and you've still got nearly six hours' worth of candles there. Or you should have. You've been letting them burn too high. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to say I had superstitiously let the flames burn higher in hopes this might help whatever went on out there. I didn't want anything. I felt sick with anxiety and lack of sleep. Go on, said Will. I'll watch. Reluctantly, I left the chair and took Will's warm place in the bed. The quacks, to my pleasure, followed me and roosted on the duvet. That's better, said Will. Mind if I use the last packet of tea? That was the last I heard for a while. When I woke up, it was getting light outside. 
Will had left the curtains drawn, the better to see the road and the landscape. The room looked squalid and very strange, with bars of one kind of light coming round the curtains, two minute glimmers on the ends of the seventh pair of candles, and the grey, nebulous luminosity of the stony path, now reaching more than two-thirds of the way to the door. Light of day showed the landscape no less dark, but weirdly skewed, floating at an angle to the room. The quacks were asleep, each with its head tucked under its wing. I woke you because I think I saw something out there, Will said tensely. He was leaning forward, staring. I got up quickly and scrambled round beside him. The landscape looked straighter and more real from here, but I couldn't see anything living out there. There, said Will, pointing so that I could sight along his arm. Coming down the hill. There was a glimmer. By God, there was a glimmer, steadily moving this way. I watched it crawl round a loop of the road, and then pelted to the bathroom, then to the kettle, where I discovered Will had drunk the last packet of coffee too. I could hardly grudge it him. When I got back to the frilly chair, the glimmer was out of sight. Coming pretty steadily, Will said. Shouldn't be long now. We waited. Five minutes became ten. Became fifteen. Finally, we began to hear the slow scuff of footsteps coming up the hill. I had to hang on to Will's shoulder or I would have run between the candles and peered over the hill crest. Another minute passed and panting breath could be heard above the footsteps and the roll of stones. At length, a dark head topped the rise, surged into a tall body and became Nick, grey-white with exhaustion, moving at a loping trudge between the burnt-out candles. He was looking at the burning stub of his candle and so intent on that and on his journey that he did not at first realise he had finished it. He looked bewildered when we both bellowed, Nick! I looked at the empty hill crest behind him. I could hear no more footsteps. Nick, I said. What happened? Nick's shoulders slumped. Can I blow this out now? He asked, raising his candle stump. Come on out by the chair first, Will said. That's it. Want to sit? No? Okay. He shepherded Nick quickly into the space by the bed, shooting a look at me to convey that Nick was out on his feet. Now, what happened? He asked very gently. I don't think I could have said or done anything. I was too desolated. We got there, Nick said. Marie and I did. We lost Rob. The last bit, that was. I, I don't know what happened. Not to Rob. Oh, and before that, we met your friend, Rupert. The one Marie thinks is fabulous and Nordic. He said to tell you where he'd gone. Nick ran down here and stood staring at the carpet. Will said, And? We got there, Nick repeated. Then, with a sudden access of energy, he added, And you'll never guess what Marie went and did. When we were at... At the... at the right place, anyway. And you were supposed to ask for just one thing. I couldn't believe it. She went and asked for her dad to be cured of his cancer. I couldn't look at Will, though I know he was staring at me. So, what happened then? I managed to say. What? Oh, I had to ask for her, of course, Nick said, rather irritably. I had to use mine up, and now I'll never be... He shut his mouth resolutely on whatever ambition that had been, and, I suspected, on the tears that went with it. I asked just like you told us, he said. Every word, carefully. Well done, said Will. Didn't it work, then? Nick seemed surprised. Yes, of course it worked. Where is Marie, then? I dared to ask. Nick hunched his shoulders. How should I know? Isn't she coming? Not that we can see, Will said. Well, I, I don't know. I didn't dare look, Nick said. I remembered those stories. That man who went to hell to get that girl, you know? And I thought I heard her behind me, but I didn't dare look in case... In case... That was well done too, I said quickly. We may even be missing a verse about it. I'm sure she'll be along. Could I go to bed now? Nick said. I'm so tired. Of course, we said, and we bundled him over to my bed. 
I swear he was asleep before we got him there. He was a big lad and very heavy. It was difficult to get him onto the bed, even with two of us, and he lay like a log once we got him there. What do you make of that? Will murmured. Typical Marie, I said. Not typical Nick, though. I didn't know he had it in him. Just what I thought, Will said. You'd think with a mother like his, well... He saw me vainly staring out into the increasingly nebulous landscape. Daylight was strengthening all the time. I hoped that accounted for the grey pallor out there, but I very much feared that the road was now fading. She'll be along, Will said. He asked right, and he didn't look behind, even though he heard her. He heard her, Roop, and it was clever of him not to look. I shouldn't wonder if you're right, and Sai or someone hasn't got another verse about that, or some magid we don't know. And it's a long way, and she's small. Short legs. She'll turn up. Why don't you go and find us both more coffee? I'll stay and keep the candles going. I've got really good at keeping them down to just the spark. Bless Will. A fine piece of bluster that was. He could see I could hardly bear to be in the room just then. I was sure Nick had been lying. I could see Will thought so too. Lying, not about what Marie had asked for, that rang true, but about what he himself had asked for. I couldn't see Nick sacrificing something he really wanted, not even for Marie, not in a month of Sundays. I tried to smile at Will as I made for the door, but it felt more like bared teeth. I said, almost normally, Coffee. Yes. And while I'm down there, I'd better put Stan in the picture and talk to Dacross. I'll be about half an hour, all right? Then I broke and ran. I ran until I got to the stairs. A lift was too confining. I went down the stairs slowly, a pause from step to step. Rob gone, Marie missing, each step those words. My head pounded, my mouth felt vile, coffee was essential. Rob gone, Marie missing, down and down. Otherwise I didn't think much, except to be surprised when I got to the part of the stairs where the party had been, to find so little trace of it. Just a litter of tinsel, a cigarette end or so, and a smell of body and stale drink that reminded me of the inside of my head. Rob gone. Marie missing. I decided I needed fresh air at once, even before coffee. I pushed through the fire door, which thumped out Rob gone, Marie missing, into a smell of polish and the muted sound of the place being cleaned. Business as usual. Hotels are marvellous places. The end of the world is coming and breakfast is served from eight to ten. I could smell toast distantly and it made me want to gag. The only thing to do was to cut out through the foyer, avoiding all smell of food, and go round to the car park from there. Instead of turning towards the dining room, I hurried down the steps towards the big glass doors. Graham White, robed and carrying a staff, was waiting for me in the middle of the foyer. It was another of those occasions when time stretched. I know my first thought was an ignoble inner cry of, Oh, not before breakfast, which told me, even as I made it, that I had been caught in a summoning from the moment I decided on fresh air. Ah, Venables does it again. I also had time to look round the calm, palm-decorated space of the foyer and to notice, in the overhead mirrors, that besides the robed and foreshortened figure of white in the centre, I could see the foreign receptionist, Odile, at work behind the desk. On Sunday, they exploited her. But that told me that whatever white intended, it was something quick and hard for the uninitiated to see, something he was well in practice with. That told me what. I don't think I paused. I went down those stairs and towards him in a rush. That threw him. He tried to open the gate as I came, but I was now going so fast that he was too late. I caught his gate as it spread and dragged upon its edges with both hands. He yelled with contemptuous fury and tried to force it open again. Fire thundered up between us, smoking the overhead mirrors black. I had been right. He had opened it into the heart of a volcano again. We hung there together for endless seconds, burning and equally balanced. Meanwhile, the node went mad around us. As I fought the triple fight, trying to get that opening elsewhere closed, 
trying not to fry, trying to get the upper hand of white, I had sideways helter-skelter sights of the foyer whirling round us like a merry-go-round, potted palms, glass doors, the desk with Odile crouching behind it, too scared even to scream, going around and around in a crazy vortex. But mostly I was simply conscious of white and his heavy pale eyes and his pouchy bearded face working away in front of me with flourishes of his staff full of hate and contempt. He hated the whole magic kind, that was clear. But it was also clear that he hated me, personally, with particularity, not just for getting in his way, but physically too, for being myself. And I hated him the same way. I felt pure contempt for his melodramatic hands-off magic with the staff and the stupid robe. I was also angry, angrier than I have ever been in my life. This pernicious man, with his mad ambitions, had probably destroyed Marie. He had tried to shoot a centaur who was his own child. He had killed three unoffending children and tried to kill Rob. I wanted to destroy him. I wished with frustration enough to scream at it that a Majid was allowed to destroy. And he had no such prohibitions. He drew back in the whirling foyer and lashed through me with his staff a blast of noxiousness. It was intended to give me cancer. I rinsed it aside. As I did so... I recognised it as another thing he had done not long ago, and I thought, you did this to Derek Mallory too, didn't you? And my anger was like sheets of flame. I thundered a whip crack of pain at him, truly savage pain. At least that was allowed. And when he yelped, winced and staggered, I followed it up with extreme stasis. Everything stopped, slightly skewed from where it had been, with Graham White frozen and leaning to one side in the centre. I should have done this straight away, I thought. My stasis had stilled the node, but the gate was still open as a writhing, smoky slit. I closed it and sealed it firmly. I cleansed the overhead glass. I restored the melted marble paving by my feet. One of the potted palms had fallen over. I put it upright. Then I turned to Odile, who had been caught in the stasis too. I released her, and she stirred and looked at me as if she was sure I was mad. Bear with me, I said. I have to lay a geese on this man. Then it will be over. You must take your complaint to the manager, she replied. I gave up on her. In due course, I said. The trouble with a geese is that it has to be laid aloud in the hearing of the recipient. Graham White was not likely to stand around for me to do it any other time or place, except here, right in front of Odile. Ah, well. Wondering what Odile was going to make of this... I retreated to the steps as a vantage point and broke the stasis on White sufficiently for him to be able to stand upright and listen to what I said. I said, Graham White, I hereby lay geese upon you, that you may not now or ever use magic of any kind on any being or thing, alive or dead, inanimate, disembodied or between states. From now onwards... The use and practice of magic will be as far from you as the sun is from this world, and any approach to it will be your instant death. Furthermore, if you invoke or use the magic or other powers of your goddess of the bush, or of any other deity, the geese will be your instant death. And by reason of your abuse of the powers you have had at your disposal, this geese is now laid upon you to abide by on pain of instant death. Having said this, I released the stasis completely. White looked up at me in total hatred. You do think you're clever, don't you? He said, and turned and went out through the glass doors. Someone behind me said laughingly, That sounded very impressive! The landing above the stairs seemed to be full of people, probably all on their way to breakfast. There was Wendy raising fat hands in silent clapping motions, Cornelius with her, grinning feverishly at what he had overheard, and Tansy Ann Fisk, looking compassionately at me. She was no doubt forgiving me for being in the grip of a grey psychic blanket. Behind her was a scared-looking Tina Gianetti and her besuited boyfriend, who obviously thought it was all just some more nonsense. And beyond these were Rick Corry and Maxim Howe, both of whom had the air of hoping that what I had just said was not going to cause trouble for the committee. There were also numerous other people I didn't know by name, 
One of these asked me, Are we talking magician's battle here? Are you going to do it for the swords and sorcery tonight? That was the idea, I said weakly, but I'm not sure Graham White wants to cooperate. At this, they all gave various cries of encouragement and enthusiasm and went on along the upper level towards the dining room, leaving me face to face with Ted Mallory, who must have been at the back of the crowd. I see you've made the acquaintance of my esteemed brother-in-law, Mallory said. Nasty bit of work, isn't it? I nodded. He said judiciously, but I very much liked what you just said to him. You wouldn't think of letting me have a copy of it, would you? It would fit in perfectly with the thing I'm writing at the moment. I thought of Marie and the wobbly windows. I felt I owed it to Marie to say, What I just said was a very powerful geese. But you don't believe that, do you? He gave a great jovial laugh. My dear fellow, I'm a rational man. I may write some pretty strange stuff, but it stops there, you know. Stops there. A geese, I said, is a magical prohibition. Mallory looked at me expectantly for a second. I know that, he said. I know my trade. Well, if you won't give me a copy, I dare say I can do it from memory. I gave up on him and watched him stroll away to breakfast. He was worse than ideal. After that, I simply could not face going that way myself. I found the staff door behind one of the mirrors and went off by back corridors to the staff car park. I felt awful. By the time I reached my poor battered car, I was shaking all over and could hardly get the door open. Inside, the gentle tinkle of Scarlatti faded out. Stan said, What's up now, lad? Reaction, I said. I think. I flopped into the driver's seat and told him. Oh, dear, he said. Oh, dear. It doesn't get any better, does it? I'm sorry about that girl and that centaur lad. But on the bright side, if the upper room do intend this Graham Wyatt for the next Corophonic Emperor, at least you stopped him from being an Emperor Mage. They're always bad news. Though he sounds as if he'd be bad enough as just plain Joe Emperor, this one. Talking of which, your phone keeps going. I think Dacross wants you. I'm sure he does, I said. Oh, I'd better get it over with. I got through to Dacross, still without the least idea what I was going to say to him. Venables here, I said. Ah, Majid, he said. I was just going to call you again. Half a second while I secure my cubby. He was evidently aboard one of the troop carriers. I could tell by the machinery noise and the distant military voices in the background. These were abruptly cut off. There, he said. Are you secure for serious stuff your end? Yes, I said. Look... Good, he said. Now, listen to me, Majid. We finally found that young centaur. Nice, naive, fifteen-year-old, name of Christophos, scared, witless, and hiding in a stack of vine props. Alexandra, Jeff Ross, and I have had a long talk with him. I'm extremely relieved to hear that, I said. Is he wounded? No, said Dacross. And you might well be relieved, Majid. If it wasn't for that centaur's evidence, I'd have no means of knowing you weren't up there in that colony entirely on your own. What? I said. Now look here! As it is, Dacross pursued, I have Christophos to say that the lesser consort Jalela, whom we all thought was dead, and Grandma Salbeck were up there too, and the evidence of a hover crew that these two were pursuing Christophos in an Earth vehicle. At least, we're fairly clear from the timing that it was those two, and not the pair I found you with in the lane. So, the most I'm going to accuse you of, Majid, is of holding out on me. Now look, I tried again. Holding out on me, repeated Dacross. Concealing evidence, if you like. Now, I respect Majid's and Majid laws, and I do know there is precious little a Majid can do if a thing is intended. But I have an empire to settle, Majid, and I don't care if a thing is intended or not. I don't follow you, I said hopelessly. You will, Dacross told me, when I tell you that Jeff Ross, who is no one's fool... Spent nearly an hour yesterday with those youngsters who came with you. They didn't come with me, I managed to protest. I didn't know they were there. They were fetched by Naros. At, at least Marie was. Ah, said Dacross. You didn't say that yesterday, Majid. You let me believe they were with you. 
And the other thing I have to tell you is that those two girls left alive up there, well, forget them. Blood tests and so forth show they can't possibly be related to the Emperor. And Christophos claims they were simply servants for the little girl. I'd sort of expected that, I muttered. Sure you had, agreed Dacros. Because you knew, and I didn't, that when I was standing in that hedge talking to you, the youngster I was looking down on was Nicothodes, our next emperor. Now the fat was in the fire. I didn't know, I only suspected, I said. And made sure I didn't, Dacros replied. Well, Majid, I've had enough of this. I want two things of you, and I want them today. First, I want Nicothodes, handed over, in one piece, ready for coronation. Second, I want Gramos and Jalela Albeck handed over, also in one piece, ready for justice. I'll give you until dinner time, Majid. By dinner time today, you will give me these three people, regardless of what's intended or what isn't, or I take serious action. Is that understood, Majid? Yes, I said limply. He rang off. I sat staring at the phone, thinking that I suppose I should be grateful that Dacros was not accusing me of murder. He had obviously thought about it. Finally, I said, Stan, when the hell do they eat dinner in the Empire? Eh? said Stan. Well, that's to be after six, or they'd call it tea or something instead. Six, I said. Six. That gives me about... Ten hours to think of something. Thanks, Stan. See you. I got out of the car and locked it like a sleepwalker. I simply couldn't think what to do. Or, let's be honest, what to do about Nick. Janine and White I would cheerfully hand over. It was just a matter of thinking how. But Nick? It was no use pretending Nick was my favourite person since he had left Marie in Babylon. As emperor, he would be nothing like as badly placed as those poor dead children. They would have been snatched out of next to nothing into almost everything, where Nick would come from the complex culture of Earth and merely have to adapt to a life of high ceremony. Teenage boys do adapt. I couldn't exactly see him enjoying it. In fact, the way I felt at the moment, I almost felt that would serve him right. Except, did it serve even the most selfish boy? right to be pitched into the situation that had made Dacros lose his hair and Jeffros still look like walking wounded. The question was, really, was Nick intended to be the next Corophonic Emperor? Normally, if a thing is intended, you have a very strong sense of it, and you know equally strongly if it isn't. At that moment, I simply could not tell. I felt a total weary blank. Oh, Damn it, I thought, getting into the lift. Marie valued Nick. You only had to see the way she looked after him at breakfast when the kid couldn't get his eyes open to see how much she valued him. I dwelt on that. Marie and Nick may not have known they were brother and sister, but they were friends all the same. Marie would certainly not want Nick condemned to the inevitable early death when the Empire fell to pieces in his hands. There was my decision then. No matter what was intended or what was not, I was going to respect Marie's wishes. A pity that I had no idea how, I thought, as the lift door opened on floor five. Here I realised where I was. Well, no point in going back down again. I could get coffee from room service. My recent fracas inside the node seemed to have put everything back more or less where it had been on Thursday, Room 555 was now only a short way down the corridor. I went there. The door opened on a rich smell of coffee. The eighth pair of candles was now alight. In the skewed distance they led to, the landscape was grey and cloudy, but still nebulously there. Will and Zinka were on the floor by the bathroom, just beginning on a hearty breakfast. Zinka plays room service like an artist. Will announced through a mouthful of croissant. She's got us things that aren't on the menu. I got the pancakes and bacon for you, Sinker said to me. Sit down and eat and tell. So we'll mess with the node again. Is that all? 
Tell us. I sat and ate and drank ravenously and told them. In the course of it, my quacks woke up. Each took a glorious near indigo head from under a wing, saw me, saw food, and spread their dark blue wings to glide to the carpet. Then, most circumspectly, they picked their way round the outside of the road by the door and arrived politely for their share of the croissant. Those birds are intelligent beings, Zinka said respectfully. They've been to Babylon. I don't know what to advise about Nick, Rupert. Here we all took one of many cautious looks towards the bed, but Nick slept on, on his back now, snoring faintly. There's no chance he'd make a success of the Empire, is there? We all examined Nick again as he slept. Zinka and Will both shook their heads slightly. It seemed that they, at least, had sufficient precognition to know this was impossible. Zinka frowned as she plastered marmalade upon cinnamon toast. I don't know about you two, she said, but my sense is that Nick is actually supposed to be something quite different. Well, that makes one of us, I said glumly. Zinka fed the toast to the quacks, who accepted it with grave pleasure. Will said, You could forestall that cross by putting a geese on Nick. Ah, uh, come on, Will, Zinka said. That's how to have the upper room hopping mad at him. Privately, I thought Will had hit on the best idea yet. But I said, that cross has got to have someone, you know. He can have himself, Will said. He's had a lot of practice by now. If you leave him no alternative, he'd never deal with me again, I said. Zinka laughed. Oh, the secret relief on your face when you said that. Poor Rupert. No one wants Corifos. But Corifos wants Janine and Graham, and I vote they should have them. Let's plan. We spent the next half hour planning. We hatched what seemed to us a perfect, foolproof way to deliver the two of them to Dacross by six that evening. Then Zinka said she would get some sleep. Will said he would go down to his Land Rover. He needed to phone through to Karina to let her know he was going to be here for the rest of today. I was left alone. I sat in the frilly chair with a quack roosting companionably on each shoe and waited. I don't think I thought any more. I don't think I expected anything any more. I simply stared into that increasingly fogged landscape at the end of the burnt-out rows of candles and waited. Will took his time. He tells me he suddenly felt an overwhelming need for some exercise and took a walk by the river. He was still away when the eighth pair of candles began to near their ends. I watched them anxiously. The slight draught from the door meant that one was burning ahead of the other, whatever I did. I was going to have to light the seventeenth candle well before the last one, and the Lord knows what effect that was going to have. In an effort to preserve the fast-burning one, I leant forward and cupped my hand round the flame and tried with everything I knew to slow it down. I worked on it so furiously that I never heard footsteps. I didn't hear a thing. I simply looked up and saw Marie coming over the brow of the hill. She was the old Marie in every way. She was the right colour again, though pale, and her hair was once more brownish, and possibly even bushier. Anyway, it seemed to frame her small, serious face in quantities, in tendrils and in fine frizz, as she bent earnestly over the tiny lighted stub of candle she carried. And she was the old Marie in another way. For some reason, she was now wearing the woefully rag-bag skirt and top in which I had first seen her, and large, soft shoes that put me in mind of the children on the hill. Even her fingernails had grown long and spiked again. She was using them to grip the candle with by its very end. With all this, she was a whole new Marie. It was hard to say how, but I knew immediately that the same change that had overtaken the quacks had overtaken Marie too. It was not that she was older. It was not that she was more or larger. It was as if she had not been filling her proper outlines before this. 
Now she did. A small, small measure of the change was that she now looked good in her woeful old garments. She looked astonishingly good. As I saw all this, Marie looked up and saw me. A look I had not seen before. One of pure delight filled her face. I don't think she had ever been truly happy in her life before. Now she was, because she had seen me. I forgot prudence. I forgot the danger of intruding in one's own workings. The quacks spilled off my feet with indignant honks as I took off like a sprinter and raced down the road of candles. I picked Marie up in both arms, hugging her crazily tight, and swung her round and round. Her candle went out and went flying. I heard her laugh. Nothing mattered. The dark landscape went away in a blink between one mad rotation and the next. When I put Marie down, there was nothing there but two rows of wax-filled holders. The candles by the door were out too. Marie's face was a glowing heart shape of pleasure. She looked up at me and said, Really? Yes, I said, really. At this, she stepped back a bit and pushed at her glasses in her combat manner. I'm not a very good investment, she said with that sob in her voice. I had missed that sob. I warn you. Neither am I, I said. Wait till I tell you. That's all right, then, she said. But you'll have to wait. I'm out on my feet. I have to go to sleep. She folded over as she said this, and I only just put my arm out in time to catch her. Knee, sleep, she said. Here, I said, and guided her over to the bed where Nick was. Marie threw herself on it. Her fist pounded at Nick's shoulder. Move over, lump! This, Nick, without waking, instantly did. Marie was at her most irresistible. I thought that, like Nick before, she was asleep at once. I was just turning away, with a lightness of mind I could not have imagined five minutes before. Nick had not lied. All would be well, all problems solved when Marie's arm shot up holding her glasses. Put them somewhere, she said. And please wake me in time for Uncle Ted's speech. I promised Chapter him. Chapter 23. Rupert Venables continued. We woke Nick and Marie just before two. Marie, looking at Nick's still unopened eyes, was inclined to think we had left it too late. There's no way he'll be alive by three. And I must go and get changed. These clothes are frightful, she said. Zinka said quickly that she would fetch Marie some clothes. We did not want Marie going into her room yet. I'd spent the morning trying to de-louse her computer and Nick's. Nick's was easy, only a matter of cleaning out an enslavement programme. But Marie's computer was woven through and through with thorny, sterile growths from that wretched bush goddess. I was thinking of junking it and offering her one of my own computers instead, except that, so far, I could not see a way to do it without Marie knowing that I had looked at her files. There was quite a lot in the latest ones about me. None of it complimentary. Nick surprised Marie by opening both eyes and eating the lunch we had brought. Then he too said he needed to change. I looked at him properly for the first time, and saw that he was wearing clothes as ragged as Marie's, very short and tight, as if he'd grown out of them, and shoes through which his toes showed. Something to do with Babylon, evidently, although neither Nick nor Marie said so. In fact, they both behaved as if there was an embargo on them talking about their time in the dark landscape. When I tried to discover why Marie had been so far behind Nick, she and he looked at one another, sharing some knowledge, and did not say anything. Will, Zinker and I exchanged glances and tried not to ask any more. Before we left to hear Ted Mallory's speech, Marie asked if she could use my telephone to get news of Derek Mallory. She referred to him as her little fat dad, and her manner made me wonder if she even knew he was not her father, let alone knowing who her real father was and what had happened to her because of him. I really do not think she remembered being stripped, but some of the rest she must have known. She turned from the phone with her face a heart shape of delight and looked at Nick, 
full of meanings. It's gone down almost to nothing already, she said. Nick, understandably, looked a little dour. He had made a genuine sacrifice, and whatever it had been, it clearly still hurt. I was sorry about that. I almost wish he had been selfish enough to ask for what he wanted. Whatever it had been, I was certain it would have been in direct conflict with the plans of Dacross, and, since this was the Babylon secret, Dacross would not have got his way. Now, I was going to have to do something. While I worked on the computers, I had come to the conclusion that Will's idea of laying a geese on Nick was probably the only way to stop Dacross. But only as a last resort, I thought. There must be some other way. Just before three, we were all smartened up, except Will, who was uncomfortable in any but the oldest clothes. I had got round to shaving at last. Zinka, when she fetched Marie some clothes, had changed into a flowing green velvet gown, which made her by far the most striking member of the group. We left my room in a body. And, I see in retrospect, that was the last moment when events were in any way within my control. In the corridor outside my room was a large crowd of people, all of them concerned and agitated. Mr Alfred Douglas, the hotel manager, was prominent among them, and so was Rick Corrie. The rest seemed to be the entire convention committee, with the exception of Maxim Howe. As we came out of my room, Mr Douglas was pointing to the large brown pebbly area in the ceiling where Graham White's bullet, deflected by my shield, had brought down the plaster. One of the committee was saying huffily, Yes, of course we'll pay for it, if you can prove it was a convention member who did it. Frankly, I don't see how... Uh-oh, said Zinka. Let me handle this. You go. I'll catch you up. She took hold of Rick Corrie's arm. As we edged past towards the lift, she was saying to him, You'd better send the bill for this to Graham White. He loosed off with a gun. I saw him do it. Want me to speak to the manager for you? And Corrie replied frantically, Well, don't tell him that. He'd never let us hold the convention here again. Trust me, Zinka said, and walked demurely up to Mr Douglas. Goodness knows what story she was preparing to spin but I felt I could trust her to say something convincing. We went on without her. Zinka had still not caught up with us when we reached the main function room. It was largely full already. The seats on the far side of the aisle were packed. I saw fat Wendy over there and one or two people I knew, but a surprising number of them were either concealed in grey capes or wearing armour. Chain mail and horned helmets predominated, but plate armour was in there too, from every conceivable era of history. I heard Nick explaining to Will, both of them looking rather wistfully at the costumes, that a lot of people arrived on the Sunday specially for the tournament. New arrivals or not, these people were certainly having fun. Most of them had tankards or bottles to hand, and from time to time a sort of clanking Mexican wave was in progress, accompanied by huge shouts and much waving of a long white banner with swords and sorcery painted on it. The nearer side was nearly as full, mostly with people I had come to know over the first day or so. I saw the lady with Ook on her, my world-sharing American friends, the singers who had interrupted my tete-a-tete -tete with Thurlis, and the three folk with a baby, now dressed quite normally in jeans. In fact, almost the only empty seats were in the front row on this side. It is curious the way nobody likes to sit in the front row. The only people in it were Tina Gianetti and her boyfriend near the centre aisle. It seemed that Gianetti was keeping to her vow never to chair anything involving Ted Mallory. I saw Cornelius Punt rise from his seat somewhere in the centre in order to stare at us avidly as we filed into the empty front row, but this was so much his usual behaviour that I thought nothing of it. I could sense also that the crowd in the armour were raising power, but this is something an excited crowd does anyway, I thought little of that, either, except to make sure that we had the usual protections around us. Most of my attention was on the half-laughing argument I was having with Marie. Both of us were enjoying the sense that so much more was going on between us behind the argument. As we were sitting down, 
Most of the men in horned helmets broke into low, lilting song. One of the three ladies and gentlemen with the baby remarked, They will keep doing that. I suppose it keeps them happy. I grinned at him or her and said to Marie, But I've got a big yard at the back. They'll have lots of exercise. They'll need to swim, Marie said. It's bad for aquatic birds not to. I tell you what, I said. Andrew, my neighbour's, got a pond in his garden just up the road. I know he'll let the quacks use it. They'll probably find it anyway, she said. Is it clean? Good question, I said. As Andrew is an inventor and the most absent-minded man I ever knew, probably not. I'll make him have it dredged. Or perhaps I should change houses with him? I still think you should dig a pond in your kitchen, Marie said. People who keep pets have to make sacrifices. Wouldn't it do, I asked, if I simply went and stood in Andrew's pond, day and night, of course? Oh, yes, she said, in your nice suit and Will's green wellies. We were laughing at this image when we looked up to find Janine standing over us in a new jumper that looked as if she was being eaten by a lettuce. Little green beads like caterpillars danced on her left shoulder. How did you get here? she said to Marie. Marie looked up at her and pushed at her glasses. All the expression went out of her face. I went, she said, in a calm and level voice, to Babylon. And don't think you can try anything like that with me again. All right, Janine said. There are other ways. And don't you think you can spoil Nick's chances because I'm not going to let you? I never did want to spoil his chances, Marie said. I just want to make sure that you don't. While Will and I stared, frankly appalled by how naked it was between them, Janine turned away from Marie, smiling sweetly, and said to Nick, Come along, dear. Mother wants you sitting beside her for once. It's your father's finest hour, and we don't want to let him down, do we? In a moment, Nick said placidly, I just need to finish asking Rupert about my computer games first. Janine's eyes passed across me like a scythe. Then don't be long, dear, she said, and walked gracefully away to the front row on the other side of the aisle, with the little beads chittering on her shoulder as she went. Nick leant to me across Marie. You did look at the games, didn't you? I nodded. They had been prominent in the files I'd cleansed that morning. Then talk about them, Nick said. Spin it out. Well, actually, they do have possibilities, I began. What I liked about the Bristolia game... Here, Maxim Howe, followed by Ted Mallory, climbed onto the platform in front of us. The Viking song, which had been beginning to irritate me, died away and everyone clapped. Nick sank back in his chair, exuding satisfaction. He had avoided Janine, and he knew I would not have praised his game unless I meant it. He caught Ted Mallory's eye, and they grinned at one another. Ted Mallory was looking jovial and composed. I would not have believed he was as nervous as Marie said he was, but I saw his eyes search for Marie. Marie leant earnestly forward in her seat until her uncle saw her, she gave a slight nod as his eyes found her. Mallory seemed to sigh with relief. He smiled at Marie and shuffled composedly at the papers in front of him. All was now well. And all seemed well still, while Maxim Howe pushed his blonde Egyptian hairstyle behind his ears, coughed into the microphone and introduced the guest of honour. Who needs no introduction from me as the best living writer of serious comic horror. All seemed well, but I could sense growing hostile magic. It was coming in cold waves, stronger and stronger, and each wave seemed to lap round me, squeezing at my heart, compressing my lungs, and turning my kidneys to blocks of ice. It was so powerful, and its aim was so astutely disguised, that, for a minute or so, I actually wondered if I was being egotistical in thinking it was aimed chiefly at me. By this time, I was having a struggle to breathe. I glanced at Will and found him giving me a glare of concern. No, I was not being egotistical then. 
It was aimed at me. I pushed it back sharply. I began to wish that Zinka would hurry up and get here. This was strong. The sending, or whatever, was being done by that block of folk in hooded robes. Now I looked, I could see them swaying gently to it. But they were using power that had unwittingly been built up by the guys in armour. At least I hoped it was unwitting. Damn it! The whole thing was orchestrated! I looked searchingly that way. Graham White was leaning smugly against the far door beyond the cowled figures. He saw me look. As Ted Mallory stood up to speak, White blandly spread both hands out, empty. Look, no hands. He had simply organised a good hundred people to do his dirty work for him. I fear I heard little of what Ted Mallory said. I was struggling with more and stronger cold waves and thinking, but White can't be doing this. The terms of the geese would mean he was dead if he even organised something like this. What's going on? I vaguely heard Mallory starting with his favourite premise, that writing a book was just a job like any other job, at which Marie sighed sharply and clicked her teeth in annoyance. And some of his first remarks must have been amusing, because I remember people behind me laughing and clapping. But nobody was laughing on the other side of the hall, not even the men in armour. The robed one swayed gently, including fat Wendy to my sorrow, and waves of binding, choking malevolence poured over me. Will had joined in to help me by then, which helped me hold it off a little, enough to think what I could do. Damn it. White must be delegating, I thought. He has told someone lies about me and got this person to organise this for him. The best thing seemed to be to get that person. I tried aiming a massive stasis that way. That was truly terrifying. Something promptly drank the stasis. It had no effect at all. Or worse, the stronger I applied it, the faster it, and my own strength with it, vanished. Like water down a plug hole. I was nearly completely thrown by that. Stasis is one of my great skills. In nearly total panic, with no stand to tell me to stay calm, I found myself being sucked towards whatever was drinking my strength. Will put a hand on my arm then, and thank God he did. It calmed me enough to show me that I could use the sucking to divine what it was. It was Tansy Ann Fisk. Or rather, it was that grey psychic blanket she accused everyone else of bearing. It was a great pal of negative power and it could go on drinking, as long as I cared to go on throwing stasis at it. Now I had it tagged, I could even divine what Fisk thought she was at. Someone had told her I had ambitions to be secret ruler of the world. Well, that figured. As Marie had realised earlier, Majids can seem to want just that, if you don't know enough to know better. Stop pushing and just build a wall, I gasped to Will we did that. That was Will's special strength. But there were so many of them over there, and so strong, that it was precious hard work. We both sweated with it, but the cold waves rolled back a little. Then, to our extreme irritation, Cornelius Punt leapt into the aisle and excitedly beckoned to the folk in robes. Ted Mallory stared from him to them and frowned as he talked. Cornelius then swung round like a conductor and beckoned to Will and me. I'll wring that fellow's neck, Will snarled. This isn't a game. Cornelius thought it was, though. He saw everything as a game. I gave up the momentary idea I had had that Cornelius was acting as White's lieutenant and probed among the grey cloaks to see who it really was. It had to be someone there. By this time, Marie and Nick were aware that something was badly wrong. Can we do something to help? Marie murmured, still staring attentively at her uncle. Just hold my hand and grab Nick's and both of you think strength, I panted. Her firm, small hand instantly folded itself round mine. I heard her whisper, Come on, Nick! And I felt the result with gratitude, as an access of energy and, in Marie's case, pleasure at being able to do something. Nick's help was electric with excitement. 
He knew he was in a genuine magic battle and, in his quieter way, he was almost as high on it as Cornelius was. Cornelius saw we had co-opted help. He beckoned the other side of the aisle again. Graham White was laughing. He thought this was really funny. His lieutenant was not so amused. With the new help from Marie and Nick, we were strong enough, but Will and I, to build one of the stone-hard domes of protection Will is so good at. The lieutenant found himself forced to stand up and yelp some kind of command at the masked men in armour. They began to sway in their seats. Clank, rattle, clank, and to hum a note deep in their throats. Damn, I thought. That was a power song. Ted Mallory stopped speaking and coughed into his microphone. Uh, do you mind? The deep note faded to a whisper, but it did not stop. Nor did the shuffling, rattling clink of armoured bodies swaying. Mallory shrugged. Suppose the constellation of Orion became animated, he continued, looking irritated. From then on, things got really vicious. While Ted Mallory elaborated his fantasy about Orion, and Will and I both wished he wouldn't, it verged on a deep secret of the Majids and distracted us, the lieutenant flung his worst at us. Power built so, from the hum and rattle, that all I could do was hold my share of the protective dome and make jabs at the grey-robed figure of the lieutenant, trying to find out who he was and where his weakness lay. His minions, being mostly amateurs, found the increased power difficult and lost their hold on it somewhat. Physical manifestations began. First, it was filthy smells, and then lurid green smokes. When half-seen things like Chinese dragons flared and floated overhead, the baby behind me burst out crying and had to be carried out of the hall. Quite a lot of people left around then, and I didn't blame them. Shortly, blue sparks began to sputter across the metal of all that armour. I saw horned figures leaping out of their seats in order to beat at themselves. This disrupted the power bill just enough so that my latest jab at the lieutenant caused his grey hood to fall back. It was Thurless. I suppose I should have expected that, I thought ruefully. The manifestations absolutely delighted Cornelius Punt. He began leaping about in the aisle, cheering both sides on. He annoyed Ted Mallory thoroughly. Mallory could ignore the smells and the shapes, it seemed, but he could not ignore a leaping human figure. Oh, will you sit down, man, he snapped. Punt, not very chastened, went back to his seat and sat there jigging. By this time, I knew that the only thing to do was to leave. Thurless had power that made him a potential magid, and he had evidently been trained by White. Fisk was another. We could have handled them, but not with the backup of several scores of others, and not if Fisk was simply going to drink up any stasis we tried to impose. I whispered to the others. Nick and Will agreed fervently, but Marie said, Oh... Poor Uncle Ted. I promised I'd hear every word. There was no way I could go away and leave her there alone with Janine and White. I shrugged helplessly. We could probably hold out. Oh, don't be a fool, Roop, Will said. Pick her up and carry her out, or I will. And he got up, pounced on Marie, and swung her up out of her seat. She gave a surprised squeal. Ted Mallory's irritable face turned to Will, then shot round the other way as Janine sprang upright in the front row further along. Janine had no intention of letting Marie be removed. She flung her head back and gave a long, howling cry. Aglaia, you Aglaia! I recognised the name of her unpleasant bush goddess. So, evidently, did Thurlis. He swung round, nodded at Janine, and swung round again to wave at his helpers. They all gave out the same cry. Aglaia, you Aglaia! Like a pack of dogs. There was a strong rush of ozone smell, meaning that the level of power had been raised yet again. Oh, really, Janine? Ted Mallory said reproachfully across the noise. Be quiet, Ted, Janine said to him. Can't you see this is far more important than your stupid talk? She came walking towards us along the space beside the platform. She came accompanied by a growing, thrusting, 
rapidly spreading thicket of dry, grey, thorny brushwood. We were, by then, also in the space, trying to retreat, but the thicket sprang up behind us and through the chairs we had just left, and there was nothing Will and I could do but stand where we were and do our best to double the strength of our protective dome. The cries of White's followers had brought the growth beyond the brink of reality. The stuff rustled and crackled as it grew, spreading out into the aisle, where I had a glimpse of Tina Gianetti, backing away in panic, dragging her disbelieving man-friend by the collar of his suit, and then growing in a rush through the speaker's table as Janine passed along it. Maxim, who was reaching for the microphone in an effort to restore order, found the dry twigs rooting on his hand and then actually thrusting through his arm. He snatched his hand back and battered at it frantically, his mouth open and his head up in despair and pain. Ted Mallory got up and backed away. His face was greenish-white. The despair and pain were what the goddess brought. Janine had the same look as Maxim. She was almost entirely bush herself as she reached our protected space. Marie said, Witchy dance, Nick, quick! and wriggled out of Will's hold on her. You two do it as well, quickly! She snapped her fingers, sprang into a pose, and began the absurd dance that had so maddened me twice before. Nick, although he was as green-white as Ted Mallory, and I could see him shaking, instantly joined in. And it worked! As they did the first idiotic flick, flick, flick of the fingers, the brushwood stopped advancing. We were in a tiny circular clearing, just big enough for the four of us, with dry grey thorns pressed against the invisible wall. Will and I made haste to join in. Luck, 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 we all chanted. Flick, flick, flick. Silly as it was, it was fun too. The second time we did it, however... I had a sideways view among the grey thorns of the armoured men getting out of their seats and drawing their swords. Foremost among them was Gabrielizovich, snarling and dressed in armour at least a size too small. The rest were following his lead. They were doing it in a puzzled and reluctant way, but they were doing it, unsheathing weapons and beginning to advance on us. Thurlis had thrown them at us as a help to Janine. I remember exchanging a hopeless look with Will. The aim of all this was to eliminate both me and Marie. With us gone, Dacross would have no case against either Janine or White, and he would probably accept Janine as Empress out of sheer need. We danced on, ridiculously and despairingly. There was no way Will and I alone could hold off the dry goddess and the folk in cowls and sixty or so men with swords as well. So far, all that the warriors were doing was walking forward, waving their swords. But each time our flick, flick, flick brought me round so that I could see them, the armed men were nearer and waving weapons with greater conviction, big, heavy, unpleasantly useful swords they were. Foremost among these warriors was Gabrielizovich, towering in his borrowed armour. Each time I had a sight of him, he was swinging his sword more fiercely and evidently nearer to a pure battle rage. The look on his face brought me out in chilly, useless sweat. Each time I swung round to the part of the thorny hedge that was Janine, she was more of a goddess. I could see the vast lineaments of a sardonic old woman building around and above the shape of Janine inside those thorns. She was simply leaning against our protective wall, waiting to become manifest enough to send her spiky growths through it and stop us as we danced. And she was getting through. Dry grey spines were popping their way in towards us. When... The whole thicket went up in a crackling roll of flame. For an instant, fire washed over the dome of our defences, blinding and scorching us. We stopped dancing, coughing. By the time I could see and hear again, nothing was left of the dry growth, but a broad black swathe which stretched over the white cloth of the speaker's table, down the aisle and along the first row of chairs. Janine's body was lying in the exact middle of the blackness. Her hair was gone, and her face was flayed to purplish meat. Funny, I thought. She has the look of someone killed by Chapter an Chapter 24. Rupert Venables concluded. The room was full of soldiers in grey and blue. 
Some were efficiently herding men in armour, or folks in robes, among the disordered chairs to stand in little huddles, each guarded by two soldiers. Others were on guard at all the doors. I wondered how many corners the troops at the far doors had had to turn in order to get there. I could feel the node whirling wildly about us. The first thing I did was to slow it down. I was too weak to do more. Then I looked round at Dacros. He was just beside us, slowly holstering the handgun that had undoubtedly saved our bacon. Oh, God, I said idiotically. You have your dinner in the middle of the day. He shot me a look as sarcastic as that of the thorn goddess. Of course. When else would one have it? Where is Grandma Salbeck? I pointed. Uh, against that far wall there, or he was. There was no sign of white there now. Dacross unhitched his communicator and spoke into it briefly, keeping the sarcastic look and one raised eyebrow on me while he did so. Across the hall, a captain waved acknowledgement and a posse of soldiers moved in among the chairs there, guns at the ready. Dacross turned to face me. Well, Majid, I promised to take action, and I have. When I didn't hear from you, I brought a troop carrier up Naywoods as soon as Jeffros could get a gate open. And don't tell me this isn't intended. I don't want to hear. I'm very glad you came, I said humbly. Yes, it does rather look as if you might be, he agreed. His eyes flicked over Will, registering him as a Majid, and then on to Nick and Marie. He looked at Nick with considerable satisfaction. I could see him thinking that Nick made a fine, tall handsome air. I believe, he said, that I address the Imperial Highnesses, Nicothodes and Sempronia. Nick nodded and then looked down again at Janine's body. You would have said there was no expression at all in his face, except that the corners of his eyes had pulled into wrinkles, like an old man's. Marie's face had gone orange-red with embarrassment. Please, she said, at least call me Marina. My pleasure, Highness, answered Dacros. I am very glad to see you restored to health. We have a troop carrier waiting to escort you both back to your rightful home. Prince Nicothodes, you are aware, are you, that you will shortly be crowned emperor? All right, if that's what you want, Nick said. Oh, well, I thought. I suppose this is what had to happen. Nick, for a moment almost had me fooled. Then I remembered the smoothness with which he had three times ducked out and evaded Janine, and I realised that he intended to do it again, from the Empire this time. It was his placid, agreeable manner that gave it away. Goodness knew what he meant to do. Probably he did not know himself how he would manage it yet, but somehow I knew that when it came to the coronation of the new Emperor, Nick was going to be missing. The way Marie came and gripped my arm warningly only confirmed it. Marie knew too. I risked a major row with Marie. I shook her hand off my arm. You just can't do that, I said to Nick. I realise you don't think he's intended to be our emperor, Dacross said, misunderstanding me. But he's the only male heir I've got, Majid, and I'm damn well going to get him crowned. I don't think my brother meant that, Will said. Did he, Nick? Didn't he? Nick said guilelessly. It takes one to catch one, Will said. When Rupert was your age, we used to call him Houdini. I don't follow, Dacross was beginning, rather irritably, when two things interrupted him, almost simultaneously. From across the hall came the snarl and flare of a beam gun, aimed, I think, in the air as a threat, and some shouting. Soldiers were dragging a struggling robed figure out from under the chairs there. Dacross had scarcely time for a ah of satisfaction before he found himself confronted with Ted Mallory. You, said Mallory. He was still pale but firm and angry. Yes, you, sir. What do you mean by shooting my wife? It was necessary, Dacross said. That's a barefaced admission of murder, if ever I heard one, Mallory said. The woman was a murderess, Dacross explained, and a sorceress. I bear witness to that, I said. 
Ted Mallory stared at us both, blankly. I was wondering what else one could say when Marie seized her uncle by his arm. You do know, she said. Come on, Uncle Ted. You didn't even like her. Admit what you saw her do. Admit it just for once in your life, Uncle Ted. Come on. Mallory looked down at her. Admit to... he said. Oh, all right. I do admit I thought I saw Janine as a most unpleasant... She was part of a most unpleasant sort of bush, I think. Bravo, said Marie. Well done, Uncle Ted. Nick, you're going to have to look after him rather after this. I can't if I've got to be this emperor, can I? Nick said hopelessly. Take him with you, I meant, said Marie. He'd go mad, Nick said. I was inclined to agree with Nick, and I was again wondering what I could say when the soldiers arrived with their struggling prisoner. His beard was jutting. His robe was half off and being used to wrap his arms in by his captors, and he was yapping, I tell you, I am not Graham White. You have no business laying hands on me. Let me go this instant. I am an eminent writer. I must say I was glad to see Mervyn Thurless having a bad time, even though it was evident that Graham White had done a quick substitution as a prelude to a quick bunk. Will and I exchanged looks. With those troops guarding the doors, White had to be in the hall still. He must have done the classic thing and hidden himself among the other people dressed just like him. We set off at a run towards the nearest grey huddle. Thurla screamed after us, Stop those two! Stop them, I tell you! They are trying to rule the world! There were disarranged chairs and frightened people all over the place. Will and I had only made it as far as the central aisle when a trumpet pealed out from behind us. It was a strong fanfare, incredibly loud and joyous and ceremonial. It meant something. It heralded things. We spun round. Everyone did. People of Earth and troops of Corifos alike. Every one of us stared. The trumpeter was Rob. He was alive, after all. Or more than alive triumphantly and vibrantly alive. He had that same glow to his eyes and his coat that I had seen in my quacks when they returned, and that poise to his body, full of life and health. More than that, he gave you that sense that he was now filling his true outlines, the same way as Marie and even Nick now did. Rob's outlines were unequivocally the outlines of a prince. His mass of black hair was formally tied back. He had on a royal blue uniform coat, braided with gold, evidently borrowed from someone in the elite troops, and it sat on him like a royal robe. He looked magnificent. As far as I could see, there was no sign of the wound in his side now. He finished blowing the fanfare and brought the trumpet smartly down to rest against his right flank. Silence! he called out. Silence for the Emperor Corifos the Great! One forgets what lungs centaurs have. Rob's ringing shout caused every movement and murmur to stop, except for the irrepressible Cornelius Punt, who was hugging himself and muttering, A centaur now! A centaur! Now I really have seen it all! More soldiers entered the room, behind Rob. They wore the uniforms I had always associated with an Empire honour guard, the royal blue and gold of Rob's jacket, and bore themselves very smartly and formally. I heard one of the troops holding Thurlis whisper, They're from the 29th. I thought we'd left them holding down Ephorion. They were followed by four splendidly dressed people. Zinka, in her green velvet, was one. Next to her was Lady Alexandra, in full court dress, train, fan, coronet and all. And beside her was Jeffros, as a mage of the Empire, in full panoply and the flared cloak with infinity shining on it in gold. The fourth was a majid in ceremonial robes. White damask, fluttering purple bands, everything. Infinity shone on his breast, too. Will and I both exclaimed as we recognised our brother Simon. Following them, 
the emperor came in. There was no question he was Korophos the Great. He was exactly like every statue I had ever seen, in the palace or around Ephorion. There was also no question that he was my neighbour Andrew as well. His hair was maybe yellower and his face a touch browner, but I was nevertheless astonished that I had never seen the likeness before. The distray and unassuming bearing of Andrew must have misled me. There was no question now that he was indeed emperor. He came in wearing, like Rob, borrowed uniform, and he even had his customary vague and modest look. And you realised you had never seen majesty before. People on earth, particularly, are not used to real kings anymore. But this was such a real king that your throat caught with awe. At least three quarters of the people in that room acknowledged his royalty by bowing. I saw fat Wendy thump to her knees in an utterly sincere attempt to curtsy. She looked very ashamed of the mess she had made of it. My erstwhile neighbour stopped and looked round at the confusion of tumbled chairs and beam burns. I'm looking for General Commander Dacross, he said. Dacross hastened between two crooked rows of chairs, and when he reached the space formed by Rob and the Honor Guard, he went down on one knee. It looked perfectly natural. Here, sir, he said. Forgive me. I would never have forced you to come naywards if I... I have heard the facts. You needed to be here, Korophos said. I am here to confirm your actions and to reappoint you as General-in-Chief of the Empire. But we must finish this business quickly. I need a second coronation, General. And this centaur is my heir. His status must be ratified as well. So please stand up, and then tell me whether you have found the criminals you came to catch. Dacros got up quickly. Jalela was found and put to death, he said. But Gramos Albeck is probably hiding. The new emperor stopped him with a small gesture. Thank you. Where is Gramos Albeck? He looked across the scattered groups of awed people and the force of it literally dragged Gram White out of hiding. I have never seen anything like it. I wish I had half that much power as a magid. Graham White came out of his hiding place under a row of chairs, scrambling, toppling the chairs, and utterly unwilling. But he came. He came shuffling along the rows of seats and among people who all backed away from him, with his head bent and protest in every motion and line of his body, but he was quite unable to resist the desire of Korophos. About halfway, he managed to put his hand in his robes for his gun. Korophos simply shook his head slightly. White's face puckered with fury, but he took his hand away. He came stumbling unwillingly on, until he was level with me. There, with an effort that made veins bulge beside his eyes, he stopped and glared at me. I saw what he was thinking. I said, Don't be a fool. White had nothing to lose, I suppose. Trembling with the effort it took to stand there and not walk towards Korophos, he tried, once again, to open a gate and strip me. The geese took instant effect. It looked like a massive coronary to me. The man's face turned bluish purple, lips and all, his arms jerked, and then he clutched his chest as if the pain was so bad he could not help it. He doubled up slightly but he managed to keep his eyes on me, staring at me tauntingly. See, his look said, see what you made me do. He hoped I would carry the guilt of his death for years. Sometimes I have to work very hard not to. But he did it to himself, really. Besides, I noticed that Korophos did nothing to prevent him. It was in its manner, an execution. White pitched down by my feet. While I stared at him, thinking what a small thing and how absolute a one separates a live person from a dead one, I heard the Emperor say, Both bodies are to be taken to the further carrier and incinerated. 
I shall be talking to the necessary people in the nearer carrier. Rupert. I looked up to see my sometime neighbour looking at me, with the same courtesy he used when he came to borrow sugar, but with all the difference in the multiverse. It was a politeness strong enough to stun. I want to see you shortly, he said. For the moment, I'll just say thank you. He turned and left. The hall seemed dimmer without him. As the others, including Dacross, followed him, Rob touched my arm and said quietly, Thank you, too. I could not think what, on earth or elsewhere, either of them should thank me for. I'd done nothing but blunder about. In the end, I concluded that Korophos meant all the driving about I used to do for him. The power of Korophos was still apparent two hours later. The convention, probably, was still going on. At least the armed men, along with Fisk and Thurlis, had vanished to take part in various events, to my great relief. But somehow all those who might have business with the Empire were drawn towards the hotel entrance, where Odile still worked, with her fair head down, resolutely ignoring all the strange activity around her. The foyer was less bright than usual because of the great shiny bulk of the troop carrier outside. Behind it, you could just glimpse the second carrier in which Korophos had arrived, further down the market square. But Korophos was now in the nearer one, and the foyer became his waiting room. We all sat or stood about in there. Lady Alexandra was there most of the time, acting as a sort of emperor's aide, soothing or explaining to those who felt they had waited long enough, or else simply walking about, talking to Tina Gianetti. From what I overheard, the two of them were comparing notes, ardently and inwardly, on what it really felt like to be a public figure. Meanwhile, as further aides, Jeff Ross, Zinka and Simon were moving people in and out of the carrier. Zinka spared a moment to lean down to Will and me. Do forgive me for not turning up to help, she said. I'd just got loose from the manager when Sai came through on my portable phone, saying he'd got a centaur and someone he was sure was Korophos, asking him for help, and saying if I didn't get myself to Ephorion to help him sort it out, he was in serious danger of screaming. And, of course, I had to go belting off there at once. It was all a huge rush after that. How did they end up in Ephorion? Will wanted to know. I wish I knew, Zinka said, and hastened away. Will and I sat on in the foyer. Various members of the hotel staff kept coming there to stare wonderingly out of the glass doors at the carrier. Is it a UFO? Most of them almost invariably asked me. Yes, you might say that, I told them. It always seemed to make them happier. Why is it, I asked Will, after the seventh or eighth time, that they see a thing and don't know what it is, and I tell them that it's an unidentified flying object and they go away perfectly satisfied? Nick laughed. Everyone knows what a UFO is. This was shortly after Ted Mallory had come away from the carrier, looking bewildered and saying, I don't get it. I've just been offered a chance to live in this empire, whatever it is. Of course I said I couldn't. I have Nick to care for after... Now that... As things are. Nick, at this, looked much happier. He had seen Korophos among the first, just after Marie, and I gathered from the way he looked after Mallory said this, that Nick too had declined to live in the Empire, and had been wondering quite what he would do if Ted Mallory did not want him. Marie, sitting between Will and me, was very quiet. She just sat there with her chin mutinously bunched. Soon after that, Will was called to see Korophos. Maxim Howe came in through the glass doors from the carrier with his arm bandaged and sat down next to me. People, he said. Can you believe this? The Southampton Convention Committee have just asked me where I hired the soldiers in the troop carriers. They want them for their con too. And that idiot punt keeps getting himself thrown off both carriers. I suppose he's harmless. But he must be the noisiest man in this world. He's going to live in my mind as part of a con I shall never forget. Bad memories, I asked. I felt responsible, particularly for his arm. Well, 
Maxim said, considering. I've never seen anyone die before. Perhaps one should. It's part of life, after all. But if you had told me a week ago that any of this could happen at a convention, I'd have laughed in your face. I didn't know it was going to happen, I protested. Here my brother Simon came up and said I was needed. I got up and followed him out of the glass doors and up the enormous clanging ramp to the entry near the front of the carrier. Inside, he was all rather like a submarine. There were lots of narrow metal passages with curt groups of letters and numbers stenciled at every corner in various colours. Colour-coded, I gathered. Simon took me by the red codes, deep into the murmuring heart of the great vehicle, and, finally, to a little steel cubbyhole open at one side of a corridor. We sat on a narrow steel bench at the end of it. The bench was designed, I think, to keep a sentry awake. It was certainly darned uncomfortable. Waiting room, I said. After a fashion, said my brother, and sprawled his legs, robes and all. Simon is the most restless man I know. He looks more like Will than me, since he is tall and sturdy, but fairer than both of us, with sharp cheekbones. I wanted to have a word with you first, because I seem to have got pitchforked into a business that ought to be yours. Yes, how did you get mixed up in it? I said. Zinka phoned me in the middle of last night, Simon said. And I'd been getting a feeling anyway that you or Will were in a bit of trouble. So, as she'd woken me up, I thought I might as well come here and see what I could do. And I was in transit and quite near the Empire when I came across a centaur and somebody who was obviously Corifos the Great, blundering about a hillside, not quite sure whereabouts in the Empire they needed to go. Things had changed a bit since Corifos was last there, so I took them in tow and led them along to Ephorion, and then found myself having to organise the restoration of Corifos as Emperor. As was intended, I said. I'm afraid so. Sai so said, tossing legs and robes about as he sat. I need to talk to you because of that. I seem to have got your job with the Corophonic Empire now. Sorry about that. Corophos will tell you about how it happened. But there's no doubt that that's intended too. The upper room has been in touch. You'll be getting confirmation from Senior Madge at any time now. She'll be confirming that, and that you've selected Marie Mallory as the newest Madge. I hadn't actually quite... I began... The upper room seems quite clear that you have, said Sai. They say you can sponsor her, but they want her to come to the Empire for now so that I can teach her. My stomach sank. In other words, I said dismally, I'm being relieved of all my responsibilities pending reprimand. Am I suspended for incompetence or something else? It's not really like that, Simon surged to his feet, having sat still for actually slightly longer than he usually did. You talk to them he said, roving around in front of me, and you'll see. I think they may even be slightly ashamed of themselves. Anyway, they were discussing giving you something slightly easier after this. Like a violently science-ridden world naywards of here, I said bitterly. Simon paused in his roving and tried to pick some of the trim off the doorway of the cubbyhole. It was firmly fixed, so he left it and roved about again. I knew that if he had got it loose, he would have played with it for an hour and then tried to weave it into the ceiling grazing. I smiled, in spite of my growing depression. It was good to see Sai again. No, don't talk nonsense, he said. You see, what seems to have gone on is that they were intending to work the Empire round to the point where all the prophecies said Korophos would return, and as far as they knew, that meant more or less destroying it first. Korophos says he doesn't think that was right, but there you go. The upper room do this sometimes. Anyway, Will says and Rob says that you thought they intended to get the Empire saddled with a boy Emperor and then let it collapse around him. Rob's sure you worried about that and tried to keep Nick away from Dacross because you were so worried. But in actual fact, Rupert, you were the upper room's boy Emperor yourself. You were the one it was supposed to all fold up around. Thank you very much, I said. Well, you have only been imagined for just over two years, so I said. I think you've done damn well, considering you had the upper room working against you most of the way. I think it's only thanks to you encouraging Dacross that there's still an empire for Korophos to rule, frankly. I haven't done well, I said. I can see any world that's offered me as Majid in charge in future, screaming, No, not our Venables, anyone but our Venables. He lets all those people die. He lets children get their throats cut. They intended that, my brother said. 
You know how ruthless they can be. They're not going to blame you for that. Or let it give you a bad name. They're fair, as well as ruthless. I think they're really quite pleased with you. So why aren't they letting me instruct Marie? I said. Oh, that's different. Simon came and plunged down onto the bench again. They wouldn't let me instruct Zinka. Zinka says I just confused her with long explanations anyway. They never let you teach someone you're married to, and they seem sure you're likely to marry Marie. Hang on, I said. Are you and Zinka married? These last three years, Sai said, grinning merrily. It's nice. But, I said in some consternation. I know what you're thinking, he said. She may draw sexy pictures of alien life forms, but I make damn sure it's only art. Sure, I said, though that was not what I had in mind at all. Luckily, Will came striding down the corridor just then and fetched up with a clang against the cubbyhole doorway. Family reunion, he said. Well, that was an interview and a half. Korophos seems to think I reformed Rob overnight. Well, you did shout a few home truths at him, I said. Rob needed someone to do it. I stood up nervously. Does he want to talk to me yet? Or not? Oh, yes, said Will. Show him, Si. I'll wait for you here. Simon showed me up the rest of the short passage to a steel door heavily stenciled in red. It slid aside to let me in and slid closed again behind me, shutting me in a big steel box with the almost overwhelming presence of my one-time neighbour. He was sitting on a bench, rather like the one I had just left, but he got up to meet me. Forgive me keeping you waiting so long, Rupert, he said. I wanted to get the other things sorted out so that I could talk to you properly. He had somehow contained his kingliness, pushed it down to a more domestic level. But he was still not an ordinary man. You know how thunderclouds produce those shining white towers above the main cloud, full of energy? What he was showing me was like that, a smaller energy pile above the main one. Being in the same room with a thunderhead is a fairly stunning experience. I was feeling fairly dejected one way and another. I said, Thanks. He smiled at me, in the way that had always astonished me. This time it astonished me by making me feel more like a viable human being again. I want to thank you, he said. I don't understand why, I said. A bit of driving, a tin of beans and a bag of sugar or so. Yes, but you see, you did those kindnesses to a person who was, on a rough estimate, only a twentieth part of me, he said. Most people would have avoided me as plain mad. Let me explain. At the end of my last reign, I was in your world, in a city called Babylon, which no longer exists, trying to negotiate an alliance with the ruler there. The ruler refused any kind of treaty, so I meant to leave. But the Babylonians attacked as I left with my party, and the Majid with us tried to open a gate for us in too much of a hurry, and he accidentally opened it right through me. I was glad to hear that some Majids beside me made mistakes. You were stripped? He nodded, and assumed dead and buried on both sides of the gate. That area, as you know, is a mass of nodes. The gate had been opened at a node. The stripping was very violent, and it took me a good many years to come round from it. When I did, I found I was having practical experience of part of your Babylon secret. Changes had occurred in the worlds on both sides, and worlds had divided and multiplied. As I had been buried at the point of division, I had multiplied also. He laughed slightly, making the room electric. There were ten of me in normal infinity, and another ten existing as antimatter. I've spent all this time trying to come together again. But uh, I don't see how you... I began... Korifos shook his head slightly and I stopped. This is where you come in, he said. I was always, without understanding why, trying to settle near a Majid. I had a sense that Majids knew something about nodes that I didn't, and that I needed a node to help me in some way. You would hardly believe how many times, in this world and in others, I achieved proximity to a Majid, only to have that Majid realise that there was something strange about me and move away in a hurry. I moved in after you, in Weaver's End, I said. You'd been there six months when I bought my house. 
That was pure luck. Maybe, he said. But it was not pure luck that you were unfailingly kindly and helpful. You drove me to one node after another, even though neither of us knew what we were doing, until you brought me to the extremely powerful node here, in Wanchester. And I would not have understood how to use this node, any more than any of the others, if you had not happened to include me in your fate line working. How did that happen? I said. I sensed the working, he said. I always sensed any powerful working, and I always came along to them, like a hungry animal, not knowing what I needed. Every magid before you promptly turned me out. You let me stay, and I half-consciously linked my fate line in as you worked. Believe me, it was like a revelation. Quite suddenly I felt and knew four times as much. I knew I had to come to this powerful node here, and I knew what to do when I got here. For nearly three days I was collecting the other parts of myself. I'm afraid I disturbed the node somewhat. Yes, you did rather, I said. But other people were at it too. And you got all the pieces? No, he said. Some were dead, and those who had become antimatter were impossible to reach on this plane of infinity. In order to become complete, I found I had to go outside the material planes entirely, to the place that is another part of your Babylon secret. No doubt this was intended, for, while I was on my way there, I encountered three heirs to the Empire, and learnt more or less what was going on there. Rob came with me. He asked for his birthright, you know. He said that you and your brother had made him ashamed to be without it. He told me a great deal on the way back. I couldn't help smiling. Our Rob likes to talk. So you'll be followed by a line of centaurs as emperor. Good idea. Centaurs have never been the force they should be in any world. I'm glad you agree, Korophos said. But I feel I have deprived you of your office. Rob and I got lost on the way back. We were trying to do two incompatible things, trying to get home and to find you, and we found your brother instead. The powers above promptly installed your brother as our advisor instead of you. Sai's a good deal more competent than me, I said ruefully. He seems to have got you recognised as emperor in no time at all. He knew just what to do, certainly, said Korophos. And he tells me that he is intended to become magid to the Empire from now on. But I would have preferred you. Your brother's habit of striding about and fiddling with things perturbs me. You mean even you can't make him sit still, I exclaimed. I doubt if anyone could, Korophos admitted. It seems to be part of the way your brother functions. I could not help smiling. Nothing is ever perfect. Korophos was obviously an exceptional man, but all the same. All the same. One thing about Korophos was plain impossible. How is it, I asked him, that you managed to get stripped so often and still be alive after more than two thousand years? He looked at me with his golden head tipped to one side and a slight smile on one corner of his mouth. In that pose, he looked exactly like all the statues of himself. He answered me with a question that shook me to the core. How many members of the upper room are there? You... you know I can't tell you that, I said. You shouldn't even know there is an upper room. Precisely, he said. So I will tell you. There are presently seventy-one. There should be seventy-two, but there are not, because I am missing. Oh, I said. No one but an archon could have Korophos's sort of vitality or choose a centaur as his heir, for that matter. Then greetings, great Archon. Greetings to you too, Majid, he replied. I had to come here to do something that would stop infinity drifting entirely naywards. The Empire was supposed to do that, but I had not established it properly when I was stripped. I must now finish what I started. Because of this, can I ask you to do two things for me? 
Probably, I said. As a neighbour or as a Majid? One of each, he said. Sadly, I must desert my house and my inventing. Would you, Majid, consent to become the owner of my house, to look after or to sell as you see fit? I thought of my quacks and Marie's notion of me standing in Andrew's pond, and I was filled with pleasure. His house is bigger than mine, too. I'd be delighted. What was the other thing? I would like, he said, if it is not too difficult, that when you make your report for the upper room, you give a copy to me for the archive I shall found in Ephorion. I considered. He was asking me something much dodgier here. I could see by his head-on-one-side hopeful look that he knew perfectly well he was. It is not just that the upper room do not like the reports of Majid's to go anywhere but to them. They also take steps to make sure of this. It would take a bit of contriving to get round their usual methods. And I would need to add a few explanations for lay readers. Still, it could probably be done. It could be regarded as a challenge. Yes, all right, I said. But don't be too disappointed if you don't get it. I have every faith in you, he said. Our interview was over with that. He gave me a strong electrical handshake, and I wandered forth into the metal passageways again. Will and Simon seemed to have gone from the cubbyhole. I walked on, with the steel resonating faintly around me, to the entrance and down the great ramp. I did not feel like going back into the hotel. I went to the staff car park instead, thinking of how to tell Stan about all this. I unlocked the bent driver's door on the faintest tinkle of Scarlatti. Stan? I said. There was nothing. No one. My tape deck was still going, but the car inside was without a presence. Stan had gone. The upper room, with customary brusqueness, had decided that Stan's job was now done and recalled him. I rested my forehead against the roof of the car, near tears. I don't know whether your car or mine is more of a mess, Marie said, with a gloomy sob prominent in her voice. If you think this is bad, you should see what Janine did to mine. I looked up to find her with her chin resting on the other side of the roof. I thought you'd gone to the Empire. Not yet. Not permanently, she said. I stuck out for going twice a week for lessons, and I'm not seeing that other brother of yours until the end of this week anyway. And I've made it clear that it's not going to interfere with my vet's degree. No way. Otherwise. Otherwise, I said. There's all this week, and then a lot of time round the edges, she said. Yes, I said. Isn't there? I felt a great deal better.